All righty. Um, so that was a great summary. Now that I know you're just in it for the money, that's um, <laughs> insightful to know. Guru? <laughs> money. Just like it for us. All right, so um, Comcast joined, I think, about a year and a half ago, uh, the Open Networking Foundation, and we certainly respect all the great work that was done before we got here. We think we're getting in at just the right time to leverage a lot of really good work. Um, as Asim said, the next step is to take this uh, out of development mode and more into deployment mode, and I think we all have that wish uh, and desire, and I think we're all in, uh, on the path to do that, and the strategic plan was certainly built around the idea of making that more possible more broadly. Uh, I'll give you our background and how we got here and why it makes sense for us. I've condensed 20 years of network evolution and access for cable into one slide, so you're welcome. I could do this in four hours also. Um, essentially, um, 20 or so years ago, more than that really, um, optics got deployed into the plan after many, many years of just old RF cabling everywhere. Very large size, fiber optic nodes, thousands of homes per node serving broadcast video primarily, and over time a little bit of data to communicate with set-top boxes, but obviously the internet changed all that. Our primary service now is, is data services and internet and streaming. And because of that, everyone runs the same numbers on bandwidth over time and CAGR, com compound annual growth rate. We're all trying to keep up with that. And it's a pretty steady 40, 50% per year towards the home and something a little lower than that heading northbound or from the home. So over the years in cable, we have just continually split those nodes into smaller and smaller chunks. And while we've done that, added bandwidth at the same time as technology got better and better. So we've managed to keep the pace uh, with, with internet growth. But the growth is essentially exponential. And it's hard to build things exponentially at, at the pace that uh, at data growth occurs. And correspondingly, as you may be able to figure out from the picture on the bottom there, um, the more stuff that we build, the more facilities get congested and the more difficult it is to continue to build in that fashion without making a lot of real estate investments and or uh, making a technology shift. Um, real estate's not such a bad deal in some parts of the country, but other parts of the country might be a little more difficult. This is not our town actually, but um, San Francisco is for example, California. Um, DC area, Northeast Metro are difficult areas, whereas some of other parts of our footprint are not so difficult for finding space and power. But nonetheless, there's technology solutions that let us do this more effectively. So as we continue forward, putting more nodes into the field, and we'll continue to do that, the way to make to do that more scalably um, and more aligned with our ability to migrate services more quickly and effectively scale the network and the and infrastructure behind it is to move to what we call distributed access architecture. It's a fancy name. It just really means putting nodes into the field that are less cable optic centric and more digital connections back into the infrastructure. So pushing the edge out into the plant is really what it comes down to. There's some functional functionality that goes out there that used to be in our secondary sites and our head ends for both video and data. And we push a piece of that out into the plan and connect, connect that, that node now with 10 gigabit Ethernet. There's more advantages than can be described in eight minutes of talk here, but the big ones are you're on Ethernet, which is global volumes, of course, have tremendous scale to that. We have much better efficient use, efficiency in the use of the fiber. Um, a lot of great development work by our partners with analog optics has happened for many years kept us uh, moving forward in terms of bandwidth and capabilities. But it is a very cable-specific optical technology that's been in place for many years. And once we go to DAA, now we get the benefits of DWDM efficiencies, 80 colors versus 16 or 32, for example. You get the benefits of, D of Ethernet reach, 80 kilometers or, or, or greater even, versus you know, kind of 20, 30, 40 kilometers that you might get with analog, depending on the wavelength mix. So these things are big advantages to us as we scale. And the, the last one there, you're not, a, you're not a cable guy, but DOCSIS 3.1 is our, our ticket to getting gigabit you know, to the masses. We've deployed it uh, nationwide now in the, into the network. Well, not quite. It's about 100% across the footprint on the network side uh, to be DOCSIS 3.1 capable. What that means is we can deliver gigabit services 
for those who want it all across the footprint. When you have digital optics in place, that's a lot easier to do. By pushing that edge out, you've really set the fidelity of the network now at the edge. Um, and before that, the cable optic component was a big part of what that fidelity would look like. So those reasons all hang. Um, and on the physical side, back in the head ends and hubs, now that you've pushed some of that kind of core cable-centric technology into the plan, what's left behind is really a switching, routing, compute, processing, storage machine. Um, doesn't have to any longer be a purpose-built box to do that. You can do that with commercial off-the-shelf servers running software instantiations of these, of these functions now. All of our good vendors and partners who have been with us making data and video platforms have recognized this as well. I wouldn't say they're in love with the idea as much as maybe they were with the appliances, but they get that technology is not something you get in the way of, it's something you embrace and move forward with. Forward with. So this is a big uh, benefit for us. The other thing we can do now that we've got essentially Ethernet links into the plant is really abstract the last mile access technology from it. So we can be cable today, we can be fiber tomorrow or today, we can be Ethernet tomorrow, we can be wireless. All of these things are now straightforward extensions of an Ethernet connection. So we've built flexibility, we've built um, scalability, and we keep up with the bandwidth growth that we expect to see. Now how does, how does ONF, oh, there's some little bubble just popped up. You are now the host of this meeting, okay. Uh -oh. I got to the point where I said, how does ONF fit in and it stops? I, <laughs> coincidence? Okay. okay. Okay, so how does this fit for what we're talking about here? So there's a few projects within ONF that could make sense for us to getting this done well. Um, Mark talked about ODTN a moment ago. As we migrate to digital optics into the plan, we of course have digital optics in our secondary, in our rings, and in our CRANs already. Um, once we bring in SDN control out on the edge, we can also integrate it with SDN behind the edge, such as the ODTN project for us would be the use case for that, uh, a use case for that, for that. As we replace cable optic centric equipment in the head ends and secondaries with switches and aggregation, um, suddenly there's a very large switch fabric with millions of ethernet ports um, and lots of 10 gig connections. Uh, that kind of scale sort of suggests that you want to have some automation and control over that with some of the tools that are available here at ONF. We're taking a good hard look at Trellis and Onos uh, to, be, to be those tools. Uh, we are building the fiber, the deeper fiber architecture every day, every MSO is, they're moving fiber deeper into their plant, have been for 20 years, as I said. It's gotten deep enough now that um, you can really make uh, last mile extensions uh, to homes on an as needed basis with fiber if you choose to do so. Um, but to do all that <clears throat> um, and continue that plan, uh, to do it well, we want to do it in a DAA style of architecture, so we'll start making that conversion this year. There's work to be done on getting deployment over the hump for some of these platforms that ONF is developing, thus the strategic plan you heard of. We all want to get behind that and get these platforms stable in a production environment. Or impressed with what we've seen on the proof of concept and in the trial work that we've done, but the hard work um, is really left to be done. We haven't really accomplished anything until we get this in front of customers with uptime in the weeks and months, right, without any, without any glitches because of the platform. Our customers should never know we were there. This is the sad thing about being an excess guy. When you're transparent and they don't know you're there, then you did something great. Uh, they make this kind of change without the customer knowing uh, we've succeeded. Now, uh, ideally, we'll be able to roll out services much more quickly over time, so there will be upside benefits to our customers, but when we go in and make a big infrastructure change, we, we prefer that to be pretty hitless to our customers. Uh, that's a big goal for us, and, and we're still a ways away from getting the platforms we need to be at that level of stability, but we're focused on, on making sure that that happens, as are the other uh, folks amongst uh, my peers here on the LNF group. So we all want to get to production. Uh, we think we have a shot to do that with some of these platforms this year. And it's already, I wouldn't say it's too late, we're already building an architecture to get us to distributed access today. And the quicker we can get some of these platforms over the hump, the more efficient and more capable we'll be going forward. OK, any questions? I can show you the logo. It's the best part.
there you go. I think we take the questions at the end because